Hi, welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the third part in our series of starting bushcraft. And in this one, we're going to look at warmth and how to stay warm. If you look at most bushcraft courses, they tend to be held in the summer months. And an awful lot of people think that the winter is a bit of a no-go for bushcraft, but quite the opposite. It's a fantastic time of the year to be out in the woods. You just have to know how to dress and how to keep yourself warm. And that's what we're going to look at in this video. So if we want to stay warm out in the woods, then the first thing we need to think about is the actual clothing that we're wearing. Now I follow a few simple rules. Number one, be careful what fabrics you choose, particularly for your base layers and your mid layers. I tend to go for wool as my base layer. Now I know a lot of people will think, oh, wool, merino wool, it's really expensive. Well, merino wool is not the only wool out there. You can get um, other woolen base layers that are quite reasonable in cost. In fact, there's some um, Italian army surplus wool tops um, that I've bought for three or, or four pounds per item. And they're really good. You chuck them in the washing machine with a load of fabric conditioner in there, it softens them up. They're not itchy, they're lightweight, and they're fast drying. If you want to go for merino wool, and, and I've got a couple of merino wool tops, the first one that I bought many years ago was a, an icebreaker, merino wool from New Zealand. I think it was about 50 or, or 60 pounds for a, a, a full length sleeve top. Nowadays, a good 10, 15 years on, we can now get merino wool at much, much more competitive prices. Indeed, Aldi in the, in the UK sell merino wool uh, t-shirts, full length tops, mid layers for very very reasonable cost. This one, roll neck top, full length sleeves, I think it was £20. The t-shirt I have on underneath, again merino wool from Aldi's, £15. So that item next to my skin is absolutely ideal. The advantages of wool, well number one, it doesn't pick up odours. Number two, it stays warm even if it's wet. Number three, with merino wool, because it's nice and lightweight, it tends to dry pretty fast as well. So it's the ideal base layer. Now I not only use wool for my base layer, but I also use it for my mid layers. And what I tend to go for are these type of tops, a long sleeve top, so I have a short sleeve top on as my base layer. I then have a longer sleeve top, but I also have one of my old woolen shirts. Now, these woolen shirts, yeah, if we look around on the internet, uh, there are lots of premium brand woolen shirts. Uh, and this is one, it's a Woolrich shirt. Swan Dryer is quite similar. And the problem with those is they're very densely woven wool. They're quite heavy and they're ideally suited as an outer layer, but I don't find them particularly good uh, as a mid layer. What I would rather go for are these much thinner shirts. This is a Pendleton one and you can pick them up from the vintage clothing sellers on eBay for a fraction of the cost of the big brand Czech type woolen shirts from either America or, or um, New Zealand, or indeed the UK. These, several of these, cost what one of those would cost. I can use these year round because they're nice and lightweight. In the summer, I can wear one of these and it allows the air to circulate. In the winter, it becomes just one of several mid layers that I'm gonna wear. The other advantage with these is because they're lightweight, again, they dry nice and fast. Also with these, the weave is quite open and open weaves insulate better because open weave allows pockets of air to be held around your body. The dense weaves, there's not as much space for dead air. And it's the dead air, the air that's trapped in your clothing is what's gonna keep you warm. So rule number one, my base layer and my mid layers, I tend to go for wool. It needn't cost the earth. If you are on a budget, then fleece 
is acceptable, but please bear in mind if you're working around fires, fleece doesn't work as well around naked flame. So we have to be a little bit care. Also in longer term use, it can get a little bit smelly because it, it picks up body odors. It's still very, very good at insulating and it still insulates well when it's wet. As far as our outer layers go, well, take your pick. I tend to go for these cheapo poly cotton type brands and it's an environmental layer. All it's doing is keeping the wind out, keeping some of the weather out, helping to keep some of the muck uh, and the environment off my insulating layers that I wear underneath. It needs to be fast drying, it needs to be loose cut, but beyond that, you don't really need a lot else. As far as waterproofness goes, I carry a poncho in my pack, which I can pull on over the top if the weather really gets bad. So this doesn't need to be an amazingly expensive, all singing, all dancing, breathable material. I just need something that's hard wearing and that protects me from my environment. So rule number two, look after your extremities. Now, I always wear a hat year round. In the winter, as well as my baseball cap, I also carry a little woolen beanie and I make sure that it's not tucked away in my rucksack, that it's in a pocket and it's accessible. That way when I stop, before I start to cool down, I can pull this on. You lose 70% of your body heat through your head and your neck. So by having a little woolly hat and perhaps a scarf and a jacket with a hood, you can seal all that heat in so it doesn't start to escape. So a hat, it's not only your head you need to look after, but you also need to look after your hands. So also, again, in my pockets, I carry one pair of light gloves. And again, not expensive. These cheapo, one size fits all Mericlon gloves. fantastically warm, dry very, very quickly, and as cheap as chips. Not that good for working around fires, but then I carry a set of work gloves with leather palms specifically for working around fires. So these keep my hands warm, these keep my hands protected. Also tucked away in my pocket, I have this. This is my Moore scarf. If you think back to the last starting bushcraft video, where I was building a shelter, I used my moor scarf as a browse bag. Well, that great big seven foot odd long bag made of parasilk also comes in as an excellent scarf. Helps to keep the heat in, I can wrap it around my neck. If I haven't got a hat, I can wrap it around my head and it helps to seal off this whole area around the top of my jacket. So rule number three, if you want to stay warm, remember the word colder, C-O-L-D-E-R. It's an acronym which will help you stay warm in those winter months. The C stands for keep clothing clean. Clothing that's clean insulates better. If it's not clean, all those little air pockets, if they're full up with sweat and oils from your body or they're full up with moisture or dirt then they're not going to be able to trap warm air and it's the warm air trapped in your clothing is what keeps you nice and warm so first one the letter c keep your clothing clean our next letter o avoid overheating and that's fairly self-explanatory if you overheat then again those little air spaces those little pockets become full of moisture and so your clothing can't insulate you properly also as that moisture uh, cools down then it cools you down as well because it will give you that sort of sudden chill so we try to avoid overheating and we do that by regulating our body temperature by using our clothing efficiently undo cuffs, undo necks, unzip. If you start to work hard, take a few layers off. Just put a shell on and perhaps a t-shirt if you're expecting to work really hard. When you stop, then pile your layers back on. But whatever you do, avoid overheating. Our next one, the letter L, 
wear our clothing loose and in layers. And that is really, really important. A lot of people make the mistake of going out and buying a couple of big, thick garments. You don't need them. What you need is lots and lots of thin layers. And those thin layers help to trap dead air in between them. So by having lots of loose layers, it helps to trap lots of warm air. It also allows us to regulate our body temperature as well because we can add layers or take layers away depending on the level of work that we're doing. So if we're doing lots of work, we strip down. If we're doing very little work, if we're perhaps sitting down doing something fairly sedentary, then we start to pile our layers on. The letter D, that stands for keep your clothing dry. Where we can, always try and stay dry. We avoid sweating. We don't want to wet out the layers inside because that's going to cause us to get cold. If it starts to rain, get your weatherproof layer on before it gets into your inner layers because all of that stuff is going to help you to stay that little bit warmer. The letter E, well that stands for examine your clothing regularly. Look to see that the, the zip works. Check that the fastenings on the cuff actually work. Make sure the buttons and the closures on your pockets are all efficient. If you've got little holes or rips or perhaps the seams have started to split, then make sure that they're repaired because these are all things that will allow your clothing to function as it should do. And finally, the letter R. The letter R stands for, if you do find something wrong with it, repair it. Don't just leave it. Fix that zip because if you don't, when you're out in the field and your full zip completely goes, then suddenly you've got a bit of a problem. So make sure you check your clothing over regularly and if there is something wrong with it, then repair it. So as well as dressing properly uh, for being out in the woods in the winter, there is something else we can do that can help to guarantee our warmth while we're out in the woods. And that is, well, as bushcrafters, our, our aspiration is to be able to go out into the woods carrying nothing but our knife and get a fire going using the materials we find around us regardless of the weather. Now, even if you do have that skill set, it's probably quite prudent to carry a couple of other fire starting methods with you. Something that you can use to get yourself a fire going that's really nice and simple and you know works. It also needs to be something that you're well practiced in using. Now, I normally carry three items. The first item I carry to get fires going is this, my ferro rod. And you see me use this loads and loads of times. It's a good, reliable fire starter. It never runs out of gas. It's not affected by water and there's no working parts to go wrong. So this is my number one bit of fire lighting kit. It's well marked up so that I don't lose it. And this tends to be what I go for first and foremost. The other fire lighter that I carry with me and I use quite regularly is one of these. A little disposable gas lighter. I keep it in my pocket so that it stays nice and warm. And it's a good, reliable flame whenever I need one. It's simple to use as well. Even if my hands are a bit on the cold and numb side, I can usually squeeze my thumb down and either operate a little wheel or push down on the igniter as I am on this one. My third method of combustion that I carry when I'm out is one of these. And all this is, is a waterproof match case. And inside, I've got some good long Strike Anywhere matches. And this tends to be my final fallback on the fire lighting. It's very rare I actually use it, but it's on my person when I'm out in the woods, so I've always got it there to fall back on.
But there are times when you're either going to want a fire or you're going to need a fire. And most people can light a fire in the summertime, but come the winter, things become a little bit more difficult. Quite often the weather is windy or wet or cold or a combination of all three. And all of these things can make lighting a fire a little bit more challenging. What I tend to do is be very picky about my materials and where they come from in the winter. Now I'm in birch woodland at the moment and these birch trees are quite long and flexible and when it's windy the tops blow off the birch trees, all the little dead twigs tend to get thinned out and blown off the top of the trees and they, they fall down through the trees and they catch in the lower vegetation so they're, they're off the floor but quite often hitched in lower branches or shrubs. And it doesn't take very long to gather a really good bunch of twigs like this. A lot of people also underestimate the size of the twig bundles that they're going to need. Now to get a fire going you really do need to go large. Whatever you think you collected, if you think that's the right amount then go away and double that amount. So here I've got my twig bundle. And this is going to serve as my fuel, my main fuel, my kindling if you like, to get my fire going. I've divided the bundle into two. What I then want to do is prepare each of these bundles to make them burn that little bit better. Once I've divided my twig bundle into two, what I then need is a couple of these little thin flexible wands. I'm going to use these to bind these, the bundle together which just helps it burn a little bit more efficiently. So I've folded it over, got it well compressed And there it is, all held together. So as I add this to the fire, it's not suddenly all gonna splay apart. So I've prepared my fire area. I've cleared the leaves back, so I've back to bare earth and I've put a little log raft down. And all that does is it helps to keep your fire up off the cold, dark, uh, cold damp ground. And the gaps between the sticks allow that extra bit of oxygen to flow in underneath. As the heat rises, it draws oxygen in from the sides and through the gaps in the sticks. In a birch wood like this, I'm never stuck for tinder. There's always plenty of birch bark around that I can scrape up, drop a spark on, and it gives me a really good hot fire starter. But you can't always guarantee having that. And I know some guys actually collect tinders put it in a little bag and they stow it in their rucksack. I tend not to rely on that. I instead carry fire starters with me. Well, kind of. What I tend to carry is with my EDC pouch that I carry on my belt, so my pen knife, my torch, my fire steel, and my little sharpening stone. On the other side of my belt, I also carry this. And in here, I've got a little tampon which obviously is a multi-purpose piece of survival equipment because I can use it for gathering water, uh, I can use it for first aid, I can also use it <clears throat> for fire starting because it's compressed cotton wool. What I've also got in here is about one foot, 12 inches of Gorilla Tape. And Gorilla Tape, again, very useful. I can use it for first aid, I can use it for repairing gear, but also we can use that for fire starting as well. If I tear it down into little strips, I can then use that to get my fire going. These are always on my belt and I've always got them with me. So whatever the emergency, whether it's first aid, whether it's 
basic survival where I need to gather water or repair something or whether I need to get a fire going, I've always got these bits with me. So first job I'm going to do is just take about six inches of my Gorilla Tape and shred it down. So next I'm going to take my tampon, cut it in half and fluff it up, ready to take a spark. By cutting it in half, it gives me two chances to get a fire going. Usually I can do it one half, but if things go wrong, I've always got the other half I can fall back on. So with everything prepared, all I need to do now is drop a spark onto that, add my shredded Gorilla Tape to the top, and then add my twig bundles. So with that alight, I now need to get my twig bundle over the top. What I do is I don't just throw the bundle on, I let it warm up. So I'm just holding it over the top first, and then once it catches, I'll then rest it down and add the other twig bundle. So here we go. So here we go, it's starting to take hold. And then I'll lay the next one down at right angles across the first one. By laying the two across at right angles to each other, you get a really good mix of air and fuel. And as the heat rises up through, it gives you a really good, relatively fast combustion. The last few weeks here have been fairly cold and fairly wet, so everything is pretty much saturated. But a little bit of Gorilla Tape combined with a little bit of tampon gives you a fairly good hot start to your fire. And the result is a very fast hot fire. As I said, I don't rely on being able to find tinder into the woods. I always make sure that I carry stuff with me that's going to work. A bit like my EDC kit, I carry it on my person. I don't rely on picking stuff and putting it in my rucksack. Because what if I got separated from my rucksack? Having the ability to get a fire going like this, when it's cold and wet, is a life-saving skill. And one that anyone venturing in, into the outdoors in the winter should have. And you should be able to do this regardless of the weather. It's worth practicing with different types of materials and different environments, particularly different weather conditions. Whether it's bright and dry, whether it's wet and raining or if it's freezing cold and snowing you should still be able to get your fire going like this. Human beings are warm blooded creatures and if we want to stay that way we need to understand how to stay warm and have a good understanding of warmth in general. And that's particularly true for anybody venturing out into the woods in the winter time. 
Hopefully you've enjoyed this video. Hopefully you've learned a lot. If you enjoyed it, then remember, hit that like button. If you want to make some comments, pop them down there below. If I can answer them, I will. And as always, you can email me. My email address will appear somewhere up on the screen any minute now. And you can always go and visit the Etsy shop. If I've got the Etsy shop, it's called Greencraft Shop. And there's all sorts of things you can buy on there. Occasionally my mini more scarves turn up, but you can always buy the Greencraft badge. Why not show your support for the channel? Buy one of those and put it on your, your smock or your Bergen. I've been Neil, and until next time, stay safe.